Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, welcome to the third webinar in our series of Explained Webinar. Uh, this one we're going to be exploring how you can raise awareness amongst healthcare professionals around your rare disease. Um, as always, I'd like to, before we get started, thank our sponsor Camradis for supporting these series of webinars. And just remind all of you social media fans out there to please use hashtag explained webinar if you'd like to tweet about the webinar happening today. Um, before we start, I just want to remind you that we are recording, so if you miss any points, don't worry, you'll be able to watch it um, probably later this afternoon already. So in today's webinar, we're going to be hearing from two case studies from rare disease charities, from the AKU Society and the Hemochromatosis Society. Um, so let me just show you our agenda. We are going to start with a half an hour presentation from Leslie Harrison, followed by a presentation from David Head, and then we'll have about half an hour for questions. If you do have a question on your little dashboard, there should be a little section saying questions. If you type it in there, I'll see it and then I'll assign it to the appropriate speaker. So here are our speakers. Let me just introduce them. Our first speaker will be Leslie. She's the patient support manager with the AKU Society. She initially trained <coughs> excuse me, as a mental health nurse and then completed her post-registration general nurse training. Then we'll have David Head, who is the chief executive and has been at the Hemochromatosis Society for the past two years. And prior to that, he was the chief executive of RP Fighting Blindness for nearly 10 years. So, without any further ado, I will hand over to our first speaker, Leslie. Right. Good morning, everybody. Um, sorry about that. Just getting used to the technical details of uh, starting up my slides. I'd just like to say thank you to um, Flora for inviting me to um, present today. Um, and today, um, as you can see from the first slide, it's raising awareness of AKU amongst healthcare professionals. Um, and what I hope to do is just to talk through some of the ways that we've actually promoted and raised awareness of AKU. Um, it's a rare genetic disorder and so many health professionals and doctors really know very little um, about it at all. Um, I'm the sort of person, I always like to have a quote, so I'm just opening up with a quote from an article in the Journal of Cardiovascular Diseases, and this was an article that looked at establishing a curriculum on rare diseases for medical students, um, and I'm pleased to say, um, whilst there was very little on um, rare diseases for medical students in the past, they are actually now um, having a short module that covers rare diseases um, as an umbrella, um, but obviously still leaves many of them um, without knowledge of individual um, diseases. So one of the things that we feel that we had to do as a society is get out there as much as possible um, to be seen, to be heard, and raise as much awareness as we possibly could. So healthcare workers often have insufficient knowledge on rare diseases, and that may lead to delay in making a diagnosis and providing appropriate care and certainly many of our um, patients um, are um, find that their doctors whether it's their GP or specialists that they might see elsewhere have very little knowledge or understanding of AKU at all Patients who become an expert in their own condition are often left to inform and educate the medical professionals they encounter. And I'm sure many of you who are out there listening today will find that um, yourselves, if you're a patient or the people that you work with, that when patients go to their GP or any other professional, they have to actually give the information to the doctors rather than the doctor actually giving them information and advice. So what do we do? We need, in order to improve the situation, what we need is a coordinated and sustained effort to raise awareness at all levels. And that's one of the things that we endeavour to do with the AKU Society. And we have to look and target 
um, areas that we think um, we need to raise awareness uh, and make sure that um, people have information. And even if they don't know a lot about AKU, at least some of these health professionals can think, oh, I remember a small snippet of something that somebody said to me, and I then know where I can go and find the information if I have a patient that comes to me with that condition and needs to find out um, more information. So the area um, I'm just going to talk about first are conferences. Um, conferences, um, attending conferences is one of the easiest ways to reach out and raise awareness amongst health professionals. It allows you to reach large numbers from across the UK, um, across Europe and, and across the world depending on where those conferences are. And most exhibitions have charity stands at a reduced rate. Um, some of these conferences, the cost can be quite substantial for a stand, but many of them will give you a reduced rate um, if you're a charity, and even more so if you're a small charity. They particularly want to encourage charities at their conferences so that you can get in there and raise awareness. But you do need to ask about the charity stands quite early on. Um, they get booked early, they only have a limited number, um, and one of the things that we do when we're looking to identify conferences um, that we're going to attend, we will target ones that we think um, are definitely useful to us. So, for example, for us that might be a musculoskeletal conference because it's relevant to the condition, and we'll go and we'll, we'll Google and we'll search any conferences that might link um, to, to that um, um, search and then we'll approach them, contact them and ask if they do charity stands. So what I'm just going to do is run through some of the um, conferences that we've attended and explain to you why they were useful, why we found they weren't useful um, and, and hopefully it'll give you some ideas on what you can do and how you can go about um, raising awareness at some of these conferences. So the first one um, I'm talking about is the British Society of Rheumatology. Now up until this year we were a member of ARMA and that's the Arthritis and Musculoskeletal Alliance. Now with ARMA they have what's called an ARMA village at the BSR conference. So a number of charities that come under the same umbrella um, will have stands in a group together. Now that's quite useful, it's not, although it's quite close to the main exhibition at the conference, it's not um, mixed in, they're all, all the charity stands are together. And the reason why that's quite useful is a number of staff and health professionals, in particular nurses, know that that armour village is there and that the charity is going to be there and that's where they'll find a lot more information about the individual conditions. Um, with ARMA, you actually get a stand free um, at the BSR conference. So although you pay membership to, to be part of ARMA, that gives you opportunity to have a stand um, at the BSR conference on an annual basis. Although not all members can have a stand, it is on a first come, first serve basis. Um, but um, if you haven't been able to get a stand on previous years, then you normally get first opportunity. Um, so we've attended this conference as a charity in the main exhibition area and also as part of the Armour Village. Um, the only disappointment um, with it um, last year, um, it was in Glasgow, and they decided to have the Armour Village um, in a separate building to the main exhibition. And that was because they were having a patient workshop on the same day. It didn't quite work out, so it's much better if the stand and the armour um, exhibition village area is in the main, um, main exhibition hall. Another conference that we attended a few years ago now was the Royal College of General Practitioners. That was in 2012-2013. Unfortunately, a lot of GPs, and I'm sure many of you have found this, are not um, particularly interested in small charities, and in particular if they realise you're a rare disease charity, because they instantly think rare disease, I'm not likely to um, come across that in my working career, so they tend not to come over to the 
the stand. The other thing we found with this particular conference was they were more interested in the sort of litigation uh, stands and companies that offered them insurance and, and insurance to cover if there were any issues. So whilst the RCGP conference may be useful for some, it wasn't particularly useful for us because of that reason and it costs quite a lot to have a stand um, at their conference and we didn't think um, it was worth the amount that we um, laid out compared to the return that we would get back from, from that conference. One of the other things that the Royal College of GPs does is they have what they call one-day essentials. And so for a few years, we've regularly attended the RCGP musculoskeletal one-day essential. So this is a one-day conference that provides expert specialist clinical training and essential information on a particular topic. Now, musculoskeletal is quite relevant um, to AKU, so it was one that we would target, and it's an audience who already have an interest in uh, musculoskeletal conditions, so they're already interested in the field that we um, can link to and work with, and so they're more likely to want to know more and um, come up to, to get some information from you. Um, and in fact, I can remember one of the first years that we did this particular conference, we had been going into a local school in Cambridge to do presentations and assemblies for the students during um, Genes for Genes week. And the GP, one GP approached us on the stand and his daughter had been, was a student at that school and had mentioned to him we'd been in there. And because he saw us, he then came over and, and wanted some information. So certainly targeting GPs um, in, in this way is much better and certainly much more cost effective um, than attending their main RCGP um, conference. Last year, the first time, we attended the Royal College of Nursing Congress. Now, um, my background is nursing. I spent many years nursing and, um, in fact, myself attended the RCN um, Annual Congress uh, on a number of years. And this is actually a great opportunity to get out there. Um, they have a whole range of exhibitors, including a variety of charities. It's a major UK nursing event with between 4,000 and 5,000 delegates attending it over a three, four days. And nurses are actually the people, as I would say and describe it, that are out there on the shop floor. They're the ones that are really caring for the patients, more so than the doctors. Um, you know, certainly some of the symptoms are patients um, uh, experience and, and that can be seen. Um, the nurses are probably the ones that are more likely to see that and, and might question and think, should we be thinking of this particular condition? They're definitely much more motivated to find out more. And as I say, last year we attended our first Congress, which was in Glasgow. And I have to say, it was probably the best conference that we've been to, um, to engage face-to-face -face with the biggest gathering of nurses in the UK. Um, nurses have to do revalidation, so um, they have to do um, and go through and find information to renew their registration, so they're very keen to learn. And one of the things that was particularly popular at that conference was our e-learning module, which I will talk about in a few slides' time. Last year, also for the first time, we attended the RCN International Centenary. It was the 100 years of the RCN, so it was an extra conference that they were doing. That was down in London and had certainly had a number of people from countries um, around the world. And it was useful for us to also make contacts with pay, uh, people in Africa that we hadn't previously had to look at um, prevalence of the condition around the world. Um, Best Practice is a conference that is held annually that was at the NEC and that has 6,000 plus GPs, practice managers and nurses that attend over two days. And I would say this is very similar to RCN Congress. Again, it was probably one of our most productive conferences um, uh, for people attending and wanting to know information from you.
Um, we have attended the British Society of Genetic Medicine because obviously our, our AKU being a rare genetic disorder is quite relevant. You get a lot of geneticists attending that. And again, our stand was um, relatively well attended, but they move their conference around and that's not always in the UK, but it's worth looking out to find out when they next have one in the UK. Um, we've also attended the Society uh, for the Study of Inborn Errors of Metabolism conference. Again, that's one that tends to move around different countries in Europe. So if you're wanting to raise um, awareness uh, around Europe, it's definitely worth looking at to see where their um, conferences are um, and again, uh, you know, is well attended. Royal Holloway University have a Rare Disease Day event each year. This is normally to raise awareness uh, of rare diseases um, and the families affected by them. They target really A-level um, and advanced GCSE students, although you do get medical students attending it as well. Um, and some people, um, you can actually come off the streets um, to attend this conference and have a look at the stands and a number of charities do um, attend. Um, so it's definitely worth looking at if you want to start raising awareness for much younger age. Some of these students are students that are going on to study science, um, um, biology um, based um, degrees and often going on to medical um, training uh, to become a doctor, so definitely um, worth considering for the future. Patient Information Forum have an annual conference. Um, this is a UK membership organisation, a network for people involved with healthcare information and support. They have members from all sectors, including um, um, sort of drug companies, the NHS, um, charity sector. Um, it's a very small exhibition that they have, but you can get um, where you have a stand and, and provide some sort of sponsorship. But again, it's a useful way of raising um, awareness to people that might not necessarily be aware of the condition um, that your patient group have. Of course, of any conferences, you have to think about the additional costs. It's not just about um, attending the conference and paying for a stand, you need to have the banners, uh, the leaflets and all the other bits and pieces that go with that um, at a stand, so there are additional costs to that as well. One of the main things that we did and an important area is a GP identification program. Um, I first started this in 2012 when I joined the AKU Society. Um, and we started it, actually the first thing we did was via email. So it's when the primary care trusts were still around and we started the program and opted for an e email initially and I decided to target Cambridgeshire PCT as it was at the time. Emails are easy to do yourself, there's no cost to the charity other than time but unfortunately it's very easy for somebody just to delete an email. So the subject header of the email, email needs to be eye-catching enough for them to want to open it and read it. Um, unfortunately we found that the email the, the, um, program that we sent out wasn't particularly successful and we, whilst we emailed all GPs in Cambridgeshire we had no responses back to any of those emails. So then we tried fax and um, it's often considered old fashioned but most GP surgeries still have and use a fax machine but in order to keep the cost down we had to produce a one page um, information or questionnaire and this actually was our most successful on our GP identification campaign with a 6% return and this is apparently quite a good response uh, rate and what to expect from GPs. I didn't think that personally myself but apparently it, it is. We used a company based in the US because it's much cheaper than um, a, a UK company. You provide all the fax numbers on a spreadsheet with a dialing code and number in separate columns. They send the fax out on an automated system at a time that you request, bearing in mind the time difference between the UK and the US. So our faxes went out on a Monday morning, timed as the surgeries opened. 
you receive a report from the company of successful and failed transmission and we sent um, around 8,000 or just under 8,000 to English GPs initially for a cost of around three to four hundred pounds back in 2012 and we have subsequently targeted Scottish GPs um, via fax the following year um, and if anybody wants details on that oh, I can um, Oops, sorry, my slides have just gone backwards there, um, and I can send that information out to you. I have also tried sending by post. In 2015, we targeted Leicester and Birmingham GPs as part of our work to raise awareness amongst ethnic minority and hard-to-reach groups. We decided to do that by what I would call snail mail or normal post to see if the response was any better than fax or email. The cost of postage for each area was £60, so it's quite expensive um, to send um, out. So for those two areas alone, cost us £120. Um, so in the long term, it's not cost effective for a charity like ourselves, and we only had one response back, and that was from a GP surgery in Leicester. Um, so in front of you now, you'll just have, this was the initial um, questionnaire that we sent out via fax. So it was really quite simple, just a yes, no, tick, um, whether they had people that had um, symptoms that our, our patients present with, whether they were aware of a national centre we had in Liverpool, because we were trying to raise awareness for that at the same time, and whether they had any patients with the condition, and it was just a case of asking um, for numbers there, and then details of the surgery and GP and for them to return them to us. Um, and then once we got those back, we could send an information pack out. Um, I would follow it up with a phone call, send a pack out, follow it up with a phone call a couple of weeks later, uh, and um, hopefully um, some patients came out of that as well as raising awareness. Um, the next slide is just slightly different. We have adapted it for subsequent campaigns, um, and um, you know, so it's just a case of adapting the the form each time you send it out, really. One of the things that we have also done is an e-learning module. And this is really to provide opportunity for health professionals to go through with a couple of case studies in their own time and in their own environment to find out a bit more about the condition. So what we did initially is we contacted the British Medical Association. Um, unfortunately, they weren't particularly interested in working with us as a small rare disease charity. Um, and the quote that they gave for producing an e-learning module was quite phenomenal and certainly out of reach for the budget that we had. So what we decided to do then, because we'd actually linked up with the Royal College of GPs at the um, conferences, we decided to approach um, them and they were actually much more helpful and motivated um, to work with us. So the module that we developed is aimed at GPs and healthcare professionals to raise awareness of AKU and ultimately to improve diagnosis. It's been set up so that anyone can access the module to learn about AKU, so that can be in the UK or abroad. You don't have to be a member of the RCGP to actually access it. Um, you can just go through the link that we can give people. They set up their own password and can log on. It's only about 30 minutes long, so it's quite quick and easy, and there are two case studies on there. And part of it, as well as talking about the condition, is it tells people how, and in particular, GPs or other um, healthcare professionals how they can refer patients to our national centre that's based in Liverpool. So how it, um, it it sort of came about was a, a working party was set up, so that was a team from the RCGP. We had the um, team uh, based at our national centre in Liverpool, so our medical director there and a rheumatologist. We had some patients on the working party, the parent of one of our patients who is also themselves a GP, and our team here at the AKU Society. And we would have regular um, telephone conferences, discuss what information we wanted to be on the um, module, 
and then the RCGP provided um, a GP who actually put all the information together in a module format um, and they also provided um, a team who did the videoing for the two case studies so we set up and they went out with um, one of our team members and filmed two patients who are um, also on the um, on the module. So the original setup, um, we paid for that ourselves. We were fortunate enough to have um, big lottery funding and part of that was um, uh, allowed us to be able to fund this module being set up. There are ongoing costs, so if you want to keep the module free for people, anyone to access, there are ongoing costs for that, but if you pay for multiple years, you do get it at a slightly reduced rate. Um, so this is just showing you when anyone goes onto the website, um, onto the RCGP website, they, um, what comes up and they will just click, click on um, and, and can go through to the module. One of the things that we did is we produced business cards, so the link on there that you can see the elearning.rcgp is the link that anyone can go through um, and, and go on and have a go at the module and these were our most popular thing at conferences last year, so the RCN, the Royal College of Nursing and the Best Practice Conference that we went to, this is what went more than anything else and um, people um, have subsequently been on and um, hopefully done the module. One of the things that you do get back from the RCGP is um, data, so you can see how many users have actually been on and completed the uh, module, so that's quite useful if you're wanting to see whether it's cost effective and, and continuing use of it and whether after you've been to a particular conference and given those cards out or you get getting more people going on and actually looking and going through the module and you can also get some um, written comments so it's quite nice to be able to see that one of the GPs said brilliant every rare disease disorder should have its own page um, I have tried to learn as many as possible yet this was new to me um, as um, are no doubt many others so that's quite useful to get that feedback and, and data from the module as well um, just quickly then, one of the other things that we have done is um, working with Northgate Partners Limited um, and this is to produce a practice manager's information pack. Northgate are actually in effect a mail shop short company but send out practice managers information packs and this reaches 10,000 GP practice managers so a few years ago they approached us and apparently Northgate were contacted by practice managers and GPs to have more information from small charities in the pack that they received each year and that's where we were then approached and asked if we wanted to um, be part of that so it's an A4 in size, it's a full glossy presentation folder that holds um, 20 promotional items and um, last year information included guidelines and courses from the Royal Society of Medicine, um, editorial from the NHS Alliance, um, it included information about the Best Practice Show and, and other charities as well. And this year um, we've been contacted again by them and they've asked us if we want to participate, which we, we said we have, but it includes a feedback section as well as some information to raise um, um, about the condition. They take um, also do follow-up so that all that can be taken off your shoulders and they can provide feedback on the follow-up that they, they do. So this year we've just completed the design of the leaflet that will go out. The thing with Northgate is they always tend to call us at the end of their particular campaign which means we usually only have a couple of weeks if we want to participate in the following one and get our advert ready to go out but it also means that they can offer a, a big discount and they usually charge about three times the amount for larger companies um, so for us as a small charity it means we get a slightly random charge of these they've calculated a different discount each year. So, as I say, it reaches um, up to 10,000 GP practice managers. 
and you can probably see now on the front, this is the first um, one that we sent out. It was back in 2012 when we launched our e-learning module, so we used it as a means of promoting that with um, GPs, and then again, we've just subsequently adapted it for the following year um, because the um, module had already been out a year, and as I say, we've just revamped it, and I don't have that on a slide, but if anybody wants to see it, I can certainly let you have it. We've got a slightly different um, leaflet this year because it's um, got a feedback section on one half with the hope that we can get some feedback and reviews um, from the information that goes out. Um, and that's it. So, I mean, obviously, I know there's going to be opportunity for questions at the end, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions, whether that's on today's um, webinar or whether anybody wants to contact me at a later date. I'm quite happy to send information out on that. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Leslie. Um, that was a great presentation. We've just got a minute or so for a few quick questions that we've already had come through, and then we'll move on to David. So just the first question was, is the e-learning module on AKU CPD accredited? Hi, yes, it is. So any um, GPs, doctors that do it, they can obtain CPD points for it, and that's certainly how the RCGP um, work their modules when, when you do it with them. Um, for nurses, there's no agreement at the moment that they would get points. However, with revalidation that came in last year, they have to do so many hours of learning. Um, and so because the module is only 30 minutes long, they were particularly keen on using it, going through it, and being able to use that as evidence of their revalidation as well. So certainly, yeah, CPD points um, for doctors. Great. And the second comment we've had to do is more of a comment than question. Um, just adding to what you were saying, Leslie, about conferences, that many conferences will offer complementary passes for patient groups. And there's apparently now something known as a patient included scheme at many conferences to, again, give out free tickets, um, just as extra info. Yeah, no, that's great. I would certainly agree with that. And, um, you know, the other thing is that you don't get unless you ask. So I would definitely try and ask at any conference, certainly. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Leslie. I will now hand over to our second speaker, David. Good morning, everybody. Uh, hopefully you can hear me okay, and uh, hopefully you can see uh, my slides. Um, first of all, thank you very much to uh, Flora and to Find a Cure for in inviting me to um, to speak today. I, I really appreciate the opportunity. I'm going to tell you a little bit about why and how uh, the Hemochromatosis Society is tackling the problem of lack of understanding of healthcare professionals about what is actually quite a surprisingly common killer. Um, uh, I'm going to call uh, the Hemochromatosis Society THS because it's easier and I, I have to commend you, Flora, on, uh, on, on your pronunciation at the beginning of the, of the seminar. I suspect most people taking part today won't have heard of hemochromatosis, but what I'm going to do is tell you a little bit about it for context uh, in a few moments. I know that THS isn't alone in having some frustrations about the apparent lack of understanding about a condition uh, amongst GPs and other generalist healthcare professionals, <clears throat> and even sometimes with some quite senior consultants. Now, with us at THS, that frustration is compounded by the fact that we're not actually dealing with uh, a rare condition. Um, so I've got, we're dealing with a condition that is surprisingly common. Um, and in fact, uh, we, uh, we promote it as little known surprisingly common, <clears throat> not technically a rare disease. We're also dealing with a condition that should be easily detected. Uh, that is uh, usually easily and cheaply treated, and uh, there really shouldn't be an excuse for the lack of awareness that there is. Oh, my apologies for that. So today, today I'd like to do uh, four things. Firstly, to give you some context, I'll tell you very briefly about hemochromatosis. Uh, and secondly, uh, even more briefly, I'll tell you a little bit about the Hemochromatosis Society. 
then it gets a bit more interesting because I'll tell you um, why, in my view, uh, there's a lack of awareness where it matters, uh, and thus some very significant underdiagnosis. And then perhaps, uh, uh, well, the meat really for today, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, a few of our initiatives to increase understanding um, and to try and address the problems as we see them. So let's start by telling you, and this is just for context about hemochromatosis, um, it is a genetic condition. Uh, and of very simple terms, as a result of that, the body absorbs too much iron from the diet. And iron is actually very highly toxic in excess. And as a result, hemochromatosis causes multiple illnesses and symptoms. As I mentioned earlier, hemochromatosis is little known, but actually very common, one of the most underdiagnosed conditions in Northern Europe. It is very easily treated if diagnosed early enough. However, extremely debilitating and can be fatal if not identified, and sometimes known in fact as the silent killer. Iron is a poison, as I said, and it poisons uh, throughout the body, so it will poison the liver, and that can lead to cirrhosis, um, ultimately to uh, liver cancer. Uh, it poisons the heart, and that can lead to muscle damage, cardiomyopathy. Poisons the brain, leads to depression, other mental health issues. Poisons the joints, leads to very severe arthritis. Poisons the pancreas, and that leads to diabetes and there is a lot more. And um, if there's a, the opportunity to do a seminar about hemochromatosis in detail, I'll do that with pleasure. But this is to give you context. Treatment of hemochromatosis is simple, it's safe, it's not controversial, it's very effective, and it is inexpensive, but it is often started too late. So we know that by raising awareness and improving rates of diagnosis and age of diagnosis, we will save lives and that's going to reduce suffering as well, um, and indeed save the system money, which is an incentive for many doctors now. What is the Hemochromatosis Society? Uh, we're a patient organization and support network with an educational role. Um, I was very taken with Leslie's observation that patients are the current experts, um, and with many conditions, hemochromatosis included, Often the patients know more than their doctors, certainly the GPs. Amongst our objectives, the Hemochromatosis Society, a number of strategic objectives like any organization, and one of them is including reducing the average age of diagnosis. So all of this is very important to us. So why is Genetic hemochromatosis, GH, underdiagnosed. Why is there that lack of awareness? This, uh, here's a number of reasons in my, in my view and based on my couple of years experience here at the Hemochromatosis Society. Firstly, until recently, hemochromatosis um, wasn't included in GP training and uh, GPs would come out of medical school not having heard of the condition, and even if they had heard of it, certainly not being given as much information as we would like now. Now, that has changed, but it does mean, of course, there is a legacy amongst the older GPs of not having ever heard of GP about hemochromatosis at medical school. Secondly, hemochromatosis is generally late onset. Um, not always, and we, we do know of, of juveniles and infants that get affected, but generally it's late onset, and um, so as a result of that, many of the early symptoms in particular are often associated simply with aging. Thirdly, there is a lack of research um, into and uh, a lack of understanding of genetic hemochromatosis. Um, it's not um, it's not unnoticed by us that the treatment for hemochromatosis doesn't involve drugs uh, and therefore there isn't a great deal of incentive for pharma companies to invest large amounts of money into research. So uh, that la lack of research feeds through to a lack of understanding. Fourthly, the symptoms of hemochromatosis often mirror those of other conditions. Um, and to give you a very simple example, most straightforward example, uh, one of the 
common and early conditions, uh, sorry, symptoms of hemochromatosis is a chronic fatigue and extreme tiredness. And that is uh, often put down to anemia or stress or work or aging. And uh, uh, also following on from that, very often symptoms are the diagnosis. So someone may, for example, be diagnosed as having diabetes and uh, that is the diagnosis and the underlying cause of the di diabetes is not, uh, is not investigated. And also, um, as many of you will probably appreciate, um, our healthcare system does very much work in silos and there often isn't the communication between disciplines, for example, between a cardiologist and a hepatologist and a rheumatologist that might lead to some joined up thinking um, and leading to a diagnosis. So all of that I hope puts into context what we're trying to do and uh, what I'll do now is tell you a little bit about some of the uh, some of the projects we've undertaken to try and address these issues. There are a few key messages about trying to communicate with healthcare professionals and this isn't rocket science but it's worth reiterating. Um, firstly, my view is that a patient organisation should accept responsibility for that role and accept responsibility for being a patient organisation uh, and offer to and try to work with the system uh, and not to try and fight it. It's very tempting sometimes as a patient organisation to adopt a quite an angry approach um, and to be uh, almost battling with the system to try and get things changed. Uh, and in my view that is not always constructive and it's usually better to be collaborative and try to offer solutions and to work with the system um, as a patient organisation. And with that will come a lot of credibility and the credibility of a patient organisation is extremely important. I think it's important to keep messages simple and few. Um, usually contact with healthcare professionals is, um, well, two things. Once it's amongst many, many other communications that they're receiving. Um, and secondly, uh, especially if there is a perception of a condition as being very rare, it's, uh, it's seen to be a low priority. Uh, and Leslie touched on that very succinctly. Um, and one way of countering that is to keep messages very simple and few and succinct. I think it's important to make the patient organisation big. Um, I don't literally mean as in creating a multi-million pound charity, um, but presences uh, online and with materials can um, make an organisation seem and feel much bigger than it really is. And I like to think the Hemochromatosis Society is, is a little bit like that, uh, in that there is uh, one and a half members of staff, um, but uh, we put together a presence on the internet and with our materials that smacks of something a little bit bigger than that and with that comes a bit of credibility when we're talking to healthcare professionals. Once there is an element of credibility it's important to build on that and to leverage that and uh, I'm going to give you a couple of examples of how we, we do that in, in a few moments. And uh, aligned to that as well, it's sometimes useful to name job. Um, so uh, again, I'll give you a, an example of that in a few moments. Make good links with specialist media. Um, in our case, it would be uh, uh, publications going to rheumatologists and to hematologists, gastroenterologists, um, and so on. Um, but also exploit the broader media where the opportunity arises. And, as an example of that, we worked with a journalist for the Daily Mail over the course of several months, which culminated in a rather large feature about the hemochromatosis being published in January, reaching 20 million people, that's uh, um, healthcare and the public, of course. So uh, let's uh, look at some examples of what we've done. The first is working with pharmacists. Uh, now, uh, this is a project obviously not aimed specifically at GPs um, but pharmacists. In our case, this is because many of the early symptoms of hemochromatosis lead to people visiting their local chemists and a proven lack of understanding of the condition was leading to situations 
where people who are loading iron were further poisoning themselves uh, by being recommended iron supplements and vitamin C um, by well-meaning um, but uh, unfortunately ill-informed pharmacists. And that this project culminated in the production and distribution of some CPD level material that um, has been adopted or is being adopted by our leading pharmacy chains and uh, that material is also readily available online if you want to have a look at it later and there's a, an address on the slide there. So how did this come about? Well, it started with us um, hearing through our membership anecdotes of misadvice. Um, members were complaining to us um, and uh, there were voices on social media about people going into pharmacists, going into chemists and explaining some of the symptoms that they were experiencing and being recommended the use of iron supplements which as you can imagine is uh, not the best thing for someone with hemochromatosis. And we decided to follow that up with some mystery shopping um, which was very simple, it was just a question of a few of our members going into pharmacists and, uh, and checking that this anecdotal evidence, um, well that those situations were being repeated and uh, that little exercise did confirm uh, in several locations that the issue was real. Um, but also the mystery shopping uh, collected a little bit of evidence which we decided to take to Boots, Boots pharmacies. And we were fortunate, um, I suppose you make your own luck really, but we secured an appointment with a chap called Philip Tordoff, who is the clinical governance manager at Boots Pharmacies. And uh, we sat down with him and we adopted, when I say we, it was me and a couple of our trustees, we adopted a positive approach to Boots and we told them that we wanted to address an issue which had been which had arisen which caused us concerns and ought to cause them concern uh, and we'd like to help them solve that problem. Now we could have adopted the approach of um, banging our fist on the desk and saying if you're not going to sort this out we're going to talk to the local papers about how or talk to the newspapers about how you're, you're poisoning people um, but we decided to adopt a, a more collaborative approach and that paid dividends for us because the support that we got back from Boots was extremely positive very supportive indeed um, and we decided we'd uh, between us we would produce some materials and this was genuinely going to be a partnership approach so where we, we developed materials in conjunction with one of their senior pharmacists and with Philip Tordoff and it worked very well and some of the reason for that is because uh, our branding and our presence and the way we presented ourselves um, reassured them that we had the credibility and uh, they were became <coughs> sorry they were ultimately very happy to adopt materials with with our branding on it in fact they approved those materials for their internal cpd training and they also agreed with us that uh, we could readily distribute it or try to get it adopted by other pharmacy chains as well this is quite a um, substantial document, it's a, a, a dozen pages of, of A4 and is a meaningful uh, learning unit which we've been able to take to other pharmacists, um, notably Lloyd's, Rowland's, um, the supermarket chains, all very successfully. Uh, and recently we are now pending accreditation for that document from the Quill pharmaceutical society and if that's granted and we see no reason why it shouldn't be granted um, that will then be distributed to 45,000 pharmacists and those 45,000 pharmacists are frontline healthcare professionals who as a result will know more about hemochromatosis than they, they, they did before. Second example, uh, the creation and delivery next month in fact of a CPD accredited conference for healthcare professionals um, about genetic hemochromatosis and uh, Leslie spoke quite a lot about attending conferences um, my view is that uh, a patient organization can contribute to those conferences speaking opportunities obviously um, but we have decided to take it a bit further and actually create the training uh, ourselves and to um, get this event CPD accredited 
and um, the creation of that event has been very successful and the marketing of, it, marketing of it seems to be going very well and the proof of the pudding will be on the 31st of March I guess and we'll see how we get on um, but the, the important thing is that we've very much taken the bull by the horns and, uh, and we've created the training event that we ideally would have liked to have seen being delivered by, by the colleges and so on. So let's have a look at how that came about. Um, the start of course with the need to educate GPs uh, and other healthcare professionals. Uh, that needs uh, credibility. Um, it, it, it's, it's really important that word. Um, if we're going to uh, genuinely attract the attention of healthcare professionals. With that credi the credibility uh, brings with it some trust and one of the ways that we built credibility for this event was by going to some of our friends <coughs> in the medical profession <coughs> oh dear, excuse me, who are uh, recognized um, as being eminent experts in the field and asking them to take part in this and in fact asking one of them to chair the event and uh, all of them have been very very willing um, I'm not sure whether I should be surprised, I've used the word surprisingly on the slide, but all of them have been very willing to be part of the event and to uh, to help us uh, communicate with, with even more healthcare professionals. Once we built a program involving several eminent speakers, we were able to go and secure CPD accreditation. And this was a very interesting exercise and I started by talking to some agencies that deal with CPD accreditation and we were quoted at one point up to £1,500 to secure the accreditation. Um, but ultimately I went directly to the Royal College of Pathologists and secured accreditation which cost us £100. Um, now that is uh, absolutely essential to attract healthcare professionals to the event. Uh, but what it's done, of course, it has further enhanced the credibility of the event and indeed of the organization. So in planning the event, uh, we started by being very bold, by going to the top professors and saying, please come and talk to uh, your, your, um, your peers about genetic hemochromatosis, and that paid off. Uh, I also think that um, investing in this type of event, because it does cost, is viable use of our charitable funds. Now, we're in a fortunate situation in that we do have a bit of money to invest in this type of work, uh, and that's not always possible, I realise, especially with smaller charities. Um, but the important point I'm making is that uh, the use of the funds in this way is fully aligned with our charitable objectives. We're now in the process of promoting the event and selling places. Uh, we're being bold about that. Uh, we're being assumptive and we are using the credibility that we are borrowing from those names and we are borrowing from the CPD accreditation. And uh, the audience is building. The event is going to be delivered on the 31st of March and one of the things we'll be doing from that is making stories as a result. Why make stories? Well, uh, it's all well and good organizing an event and all the credibility that comes with it and the promotion of it and so on. But there'll be a couple of hundred people perhaps in the audience and some of them will already be aware of hemochromatosis. Um, but if we can get some good stories um, from the speakers, from the research that's disclosed at the event, then we can reach far more than that through various I mocked up a newspaper here, but usually it would be it would be websites and e-publications nowadays, of course, as well, and through the colleges and so on. But we will be following up the event with as much as we can in terms of specialist media. Final example: the distribution of materials to hospitals across the country. So uh, this is quite straightforward. We've produced an information pack and it's, uh, it's pictured there on the slide. Um, it's quite striking and we are now working on distributing those. In fact, I'm sat here in the office surrounded by them. Uh, we are now working on distributing these to uh, 
uh, all of the hospitals that deal with hemochromatosis patients across the UK. So why are we doing this? Uh, well, it starts again from the need to educate people. <clears throat> and to do that, we need credibility and we must attract attention, of course. So we designed this material, I'll just go back to that last, last slide, and in such a way that when it arrives <clears throat> at a hospital department that are probably dealing with lots and lots of communications, it stands out a little bit. And uh, we've deliberately used, uh, of course we would use our own, own, own branding, but um, the, the, these colours really stand out and give the pack a sort of semi-official clinical urgency type of impression. And, uh, and credibility again, and we believe this will result in the packs being opened and investigated, um, whereas often a stack of leaflets in an envelope will just be opened and then pushed to one side. So we're being very proactive about distributing. Um, we, we have set ourselves the objective of sending uh, one to every hospital uh, in the UK that deals with hemochromatosis patients, but we also do distribute them on request, of course. We're reaching all sorts of NHS staff uh, as a result of that, and we know that it is, I've written here, it appears to be welcome, but we know that it's welcome. And the bottom line is that the NHS don't provide this type of information for their staff about any condition. And unless we take responsibility as a patient organization for educating people, nobody else will. Uh, now, it should be provided by the NHS, of course it should, to their staff, but being pragmatic about it, that's just not happening. Uh, through, through staff, we're also reaching patients. Um, the material that, that is uh, included in the pack educates staff, hopefully, but also um, then patients will be given good quality information and they'll be introduced to the society as well, of course, which we, we, we can support them further. And again, it's all a question of building credibility and building trust. Our objective is that THS becomes the go-to place for any information about genetic hemochromatosis, and this is certainly contributing to that. And uh, yes, there they are, a planned bulk distribution to every UK hospital, and I can get around to go down to the post office. So in very brief summary, raising awareness across healthcare professionals. Don't under un underestimate the influence of patient organizations, especially as you can build credibility, and that tends to snowball. Be bold, assumptive, and leverage that credibility, um, creating an event worthy of CPD accreditation is an example of that. Allocate resources. Good quality, professional looking materials more than justify the use of a charity's money, I believe. And think about what motivates the audience. Uh, a very good example of that is the CPD accreditation and the fact that so many doctors and other healthcare professionals have to have those CPD points. So that's me. I'll happily answer any questions, of course, and uh, hand back to Flora. Thank you very much, David. Um, I just want to commend both speakers briefly on being so prompt and on time with their presentations. It's always refreshing when people stick to their time slots. Um, I would now welcome everyone who's listening to send in your questions. To repeat, there is a subcategory on your dashboard that has questions where you can type them in and we can then assign them to speakers. Um, while we wait for new questions to come in, we already did have a question at the end of Leslie's we didn't get round to, which was just asking how did the AKU Society get the emails and fax numbers for surgeries around the UK? I did think somebody would ask that. Um, it, um, we were very fortunate when... Oh. Sorry about that. I um, uh, wasn't uh, prepared with my microphone. Um, I thought somebody would, would probably ask that. Um, in 2012, when we first did our GP identification campaign, we were fortunate enough to have an intern working with us through the summer. It is quite a monotonous process. So 
basically it was going on to the NHS website where all the GPs and numbers and contact details are all listed and, and basically working your way through them and pulling them all off. So the intern we had back in 2012 did all 8,000 of the English GPs. I did all the Scottish ones and I know it was so monotonous, I, I did it um, a little bit, probably an hour each day over quite a lengthy period of time. And then one of my colleagues subsequently did um, Wales and Northern Ireland. So it is quite a lengthy process. And I have to say, we have them listed already. So rather than um, any of you having to go through that process again, and certainly for those of you that may not be as fortunate as us to have an intern, I can certainly provide the list of numbers that we have. And I have already done this to um, one charity that approached us. Um, and I think they're pretty much still um, up to date. Obviously, sometimes numbers change or, or no longer used. They become discontinued. But um, certainly, anyone is welcome to have the lists that we have already. Great. Thank you, Leslie. That's actually a question that came in while you were speaking of, can people have access to it? <laughs> um, so thank you very much for sharing it. Um, then we've got a question um, come in as well um, of all the methods that's been recommended by both Leslie and David. Uh, which would be the one you'd recommend as the one thing for patient groups to do? So if it was a conference, the GP identification program, e-learning module, the information packs, um, I'll send it to Leslie first and then David, what would be the one thing you'd recommend to small patient groups? Um, well, for me, whilst the GP identification program was certainly um, one to do and to target GPs to identify patients, um, I think if you were, so that would be the one to do if you specifically wanted to identify patients and, and where they were to get information out to, to those surgeries. Um, but for me, probably, now whether that's because it's my nursing background and I have a soft spot for the Royal College of Nursing, but um, targeting health professionals, for me, it was probably the Royal College of Nursing, the RCN Congress, because so many nurses attend that event. It's the biggest event in the UK, and they were certainly motivated and interest. We, we were busy virtually all day with nurses coming up to the stand um, and asking us for information and going away with the e-learning business cards that we have published. And as I say, they're the ones that are really out on the the, the shop floor seeing the patient. So, you know, one of the things that um, people with AKU have is their urine goes dark or black in colour when left in the air. Nurses are certainly going to be out there testing urine and seeing urine um, on the wards or in GP surgeries. So for me, probably that is one that I would certainly say um, is one to target and uh, and probably a way of getting out to more health health professionals than some of the others. Right. And David, what would you recommend? Uh, yes, I, I, I would go with the reaching the, the hospitals through the information packs that we're sending out. Um, I, I think it's so important that we we're reaching the uh, the nurses in the hospitals and the the other the professionals that are at the cold face uh, and also that has the knock-on effect is that as people learn, they're in an environment where that information also gets passed to patients as well. Um, which is, uh, of course, important to us as we're, we're trying to support people and provide them with information. Brilliant. And we've also had a comment in from one of the attendees about this question as well, um, who recommended to think carefully about your target audience and then adjust the message to that audience. So if your disease is very rare and your audience is quite general, then have a hook to draw people in. For example, relate your rare disease to a more common condition um, to, again, help researchers focus on it. Um, so that is a very useful comment, thank you. And then we also have a couple more questions that have come in. So I think a very valid question is, given the increasing number of disease-specific education programs, to what degree do you as speakers think that clinicians will experience fatigue around learning all of these? And how can the rare disease community collectively deal with this? Any thoughts? Uh, yeah, I can I can comment. Um, I, I think I think the the short answer is yes. Hugely, they they do suffer with fatigue. Um, they're 
bombarded with information, um, particularly GPs practices, um, and also they're under a lot of pressure anyway. Um, and, uh, and and rare diseases aren't attractive in in those circumstances for someone someone to be learning about or, or reading reading further about. Um, so yes, it is a danger. Um, I think that's largely why we've uh, tried to go down the route of having CPD accreditation. So the CPD accreditation for the, the materials that have gone to pharmacists and will shortly be going to doctors, and the CPD accreditation for the event, because that that gives an incentive which is a little bit more selfish, but it is still an incentive for doctors uh, and others to be to be looking at what we what we're doing. I would certainly agree with um, David there. Um, I mean, it's like dangling a carrot in front of them, really. Um, and, and that's with the e-learning module that we did. Um, yes, they are bombarded by training and resources. But again, you know, we, we had it so it was CPD accredited. Um, and it's also very short. It's only 30 minutes long with a couple of case histories in. So, you know, it, the other thing is to bear in mind not to, to, to make any learning module or information too long um, because, you know, particularly when um, health professionals are very pressured with their time, if it's something that they can do quite quickly in between maybe appointments or something, then they may be more likely to do it. And at the end of the day, if they're going to get something out of it, then again, they're more likely to do it. Brilliant. We just had a comment to Leslie of thank you for sharing the list. That's a great example of a uh, small patient group collaboration. Um, and a question that's come in is, are there any regulations or laws to be aware of when you're reaching out to healthcare professionals? So for example, are there regulations about recommending certain medicines for the rare disease or um, data protection? Are there any issues that you're aware of, of communicating with healthcare professionals? I think it's, it would be the same wherever you are. I mean, you know, as a patient organisation, we provide information rather than give advice. Um, you know, we might guide people. So if, if I just use an example, when we're working with our patients, quite a lot of the time they might come to us and ask for information on um, insurance or travel insurance. and whenever I give anything to them, I would say, whilst I wouldn't necessarily recommend a particular um, insurance company or travel insurance company, I know that there are these particular ones that will look at people with a long-term health condition. And I think it's just about being sensible and thinking the same way, really, when you talk to, to health professionals. You know, you're there to inform them and give them information rather than advise them what to do. Um, so, you know, we will provide information about the condition, what options are out there for, for them as a physician in terms of referral for patients um, and treatments. Um, for AKU, there is actually only one potential treatment at the moment, and that is only available at the National Centre in Liverpool um, because it is an off-license um, medication. So, um, you know, it just depends on what it is, what the information you have to, to give over and just think about it before you, you actually say and discuss it with the health professional. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think it all boils down to, to, to common sense. Um, uh, it's not so much a, 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 a rule, but um, something to be uh, perhaps a little bit cautious of is involving commercial organisations in the production of materials or the sponsorship of, a, of an event, um, because that could possibly be perceived as um, sales or promotion rather than simply informing uh, a group of professionals about a condition. Brilliant. I've just gotten a comment from one of our listeners who's actually, he's involved in a rare disease patient group, but he's also the uh, GP who helped write the AKU Society uh, e-learning module. And that's where his comment was coming on how you address it properly. Um, with his patient group, they didn't specifically target GPs, but actually looked at the different key symptoms that the conditions were um, causing, and then reaching out to the specialists that might see patients for those specific um, symptoms. So that, again, might be another approach to making sure you avoid um, doctor fatigue and really specialize um, and hone in on the people seeing the patients that you might be trying to support. Um, 
Um, just um, linking in on, on that question, um, the, the way our module was done, and with, with AKU, a lot of the information with AKU um, can be linked with more fundamental disease arthritis. So the idea was that it would link, certainly with the G, RCGP module, um, it could link off, um, you know, there might be searching or going on to look up arthritis, and then obviously could link to our module, um, because, you know, GPs might have somebody coming in to their surgery, complaining of low back pain, problems with joints, and um, you know it's just encouraging health professionals to think outside the box that they might normally think about. So you know, rather than just thinking this person's got arthritis, um, you know, they might just sort of think, oh, I've done this module. They're, they're younger than I would normally expect somebody to present with arthritis. Could it be with low back pain, AKU instead? So it's you know encouraging them, linking to more fundamental um, conditions, but perhaps thinking outside that box that it could be something else as well. I'd, I'd endorse that and um, and and give another example, if I may, and that is um, uh, an endocrinologist faced with um, a patient who is. Uh, suffering with diabetes um, or erectile dysfunction, um, both of which are hormonal, um, should be also considering genetic hemochromatosis. So we 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 would endeavour to communicate with endocrinologists along those lines. So yeah, I'd endorse that. Great. And one general question: Is there a list anywhere of geneticists or genetic counsellors that can be accessed, or either of you aware of such a resource? Um, I'm not. I don't um, have access, or I'm not aware of one specifically. Um, I mean, obviously, one of the things when we went to um, the genetic medicine conference is you get a list of delegates that attended there as part of the pack for exhibitors. So certainly in future, when we send information out or we're sending questionnaires out, you could then use that as a link to to target specific people. I mean, obviously. There are specific um, genetic um, uh, laboratories around the country where if people do go for genetic testing, where tests and, and samples are sent, and you can certainly target them. I, I'm sure th there is probably something out there, but we don't have one, and I haven't had come across it, but I'm sure there probably is, and if we search hard enough, somebody will have it and we'll probably find it. There, there is an organization um, called the Genetic Counselor Registration Board, um, or, uh, or also known as the Associate, Association of Genetic Nurses and Counsellors. Um, and so, if, if you if, if you were to Google that AGNC, you'll find that. Um, also, I, I if it's someone if the, if your questioner is looking for counsellor in a specific area or hospital, I might be able to help you. Want to link them up with me, Flora? Okay, brilliant. So, if uh, that is something interested, then please do send me an email, and I can introduce you uh, via email. Um, and we've also got a comment from a listener saying that there is a UK genetic network and we can send that out as well. So I'll put that into a follow-up email if you just send me directly an email. Um, a question uh, I think that's come out of your comment, David, around putting together a specific conference for GPs is, do you think that a GP might be interested in joining a webinar if a patient group were to hold a webinar on the, the specific condition and do some Q&A there? Is that something you feel people would be interested in? Uh, if I was honest, they'd, they'd, I'd say they'd have to be the incentive of some sort of accreditation. So if it was a way of garnering uh, an hour's CPD, uh, then yes, it would probably be successful. It, that's, that's my personal speculation. Okay, brilliant. And we've got one final question. Again, if you have any questions, um, listeners, please do send them in. Uh, it's a question about uh, research specifically. And is there a way to sort of collect research data on everyday experiences of living with rare diseases that might then help with furthering research and getting more clinical involvement into the condition? Are we both waiting for each other, Leslie? <laughs> um, I, I, I can comment in that um, THS is at, the, at this very moment in the process of putting together quite a comprehensive patient survey, and we, we have an aspiration to collect 
um, a thousand data sets uh, about people's experience of iron overload and the symptoms uh, and one of the key reasons for, for doing that is we're hoping to produce some statistics that will influence where researchers might look. So as a small example, um, if we were to identify that there was a higher prevalence of certain cancers amongst people with iron overload, then that might steer some cancer research money um, into the condition. Um, but I think patient organizations have got an important role to play here because that data is not going to be found unless we go looking for it and we have the constituents as well, we have the links with patients and their families to be able to gather this data. Yeah, I would certainly um, ag agree with David there. We, we do um, patient or sort of service user surveys as well um, and quite often from that as well as research and work that we know is going on, um, we, we can utilise that and, and certainly in terms of looking for grant applications to do pieces of work um, as well and we link up with um, certain universities and departments where we know they have a particular particular interest um, in AKU um, and then you know what sort of research they might want to do, the sort of things that our uh, patient group um, want work done on and then we'll go out as well and, and use that information to um, find any grants that we might then be able to do that piece of work. So it's probably us as an organisation that, that keeps that information and collates it um, and um, you know try and get as much as we can from the, the people that we work with really. Brilliant. Um, while we wait for a few more questions to come in, please do send them in. I just wanted to share some upcoming things that Find a Cure are doing um, for you who you might be interested in. Um, so we just have an upcoming conference on drug repurposing for rare diseases, which is actually happening at the Royal College of Nursing um, on Rare Disease Day, which you are all very well welcome to attend. There's a link there to sign up. Our next webinar is going to be an introduction to medical research. So we're going to have two speakers in similar format to today introducing what basic preclinical research is and explaining what clinical research is. So if you have any confusion there, they will hopefully help you sort it out. And then we have our first workshop of the year happening on the 28th of April, which will be in London, which will be exploring community fundraising and how you can really engage your community to raise some funds, possibly for some of the different outreach programs that are happening today, that we are talking about today. Um, so that will be shared around as well if you are interested in attending. I think we've got some more questions now. Um, there was a question on, can you think of any other ways that we could improve the time taken to diagnosis? I'll throw that to David first because that's an area obviously you're focusing very much on and then we'll go over to Leslie. Uh, yes, um, I, I'm not quite sure what the question is driving at in, in terms of any other ways. Uh, we, we Awareness raising is the, is, the, is, the way, is the way to do it um, and uh, we, we will keep battling on at that and, and all of the methods that have been uh, described today have a, have, a, have a role to play there. Um, I was particularly taken with um, Leslie's observation which I followed up and reinforced about reaching some of the consultants um, who are diagnosing um, diagnosing symptoms rather than diagnosing the underlying condition, rheumatologists, endocrinologists and so on. So if there was some way of breaking down some of the silos that our healthcare system work in and getting those people in those disciplines to talk to each other more, I think I think that could accelerate diagnosis. How we would actually go about that, I'm not quite sure. The NHS culture is a big thing to be tackling. Um, I, I think um, the difficulty with um, a lot of uh, rare conditions, of course, is they're rare um, and so, you know, um, doctors, um, health professionals don't really know enough about them to to then be able to diagnose so you know unfortunately I think it's one of those things um, even with some knowledge I think to get a diagnosis for some of these conditions is always going to, to 
to take time. I think you know the problem with the pressure of the NHS and um, you know with GPs, they often only have a 10-minute slot for a, an appointment, um, and that often isn't enough to really get all the information from the, the patient that they're seeing. And you know, as I say, certainly with AKU, um, it can present very similar to um, arthritis, and so often many of our um, people are diagnosed with severe early onset arthritis, and that's the diagnosis they sit with for, for some time. Um, so ideally, you want them to be referred on to a specialist um, rheumatologist or a metabolic consultant um, with the idea that they might get an early diagnosis. So I think it's about raising awareness, particularly amongst GPs, um, and that if there's any doubt that it could be anything else that they really should be referring on rather than trying to manage um, and, and think it's something themselves. Um, and then, you know, certainly for, for AKU, it would be ensuring that rheumatologists and the sort of people that these the patients are then referred on to um, are aware so that they can then make the early diagnosis. Um, you know, quite a number of our, our patients don't get diagnosed until later on in life when they're going for a joint replacement and the, the orthopedic surgeons then open up the joint and see that the joint is all black inside and that's how a diagnosis is made. So I don't know that we'll necessarily for many of our people get an earlier diagnosis but it's just where's that starting point that's where we need to um, you know get GPs thinking outside the box and referring on because they don't always do that and with our um, cost restricted NHS I know it's often difficult um, but hopefully um, you know that would improve and, and ensure that some of our patients get an earlier diagnosis. Right thank you we've had a comment that. through oh sorry go so I was just going to add to that, if I may, for, with um, an observation about rheumatology. Um, and there was a recent piece of research by uh, a doctor, Patrick Kiley, at St. George's in London, um, which looked at the link between arthritis and um, iron overload. And his conclusion was that if rheumatologists were more switched on to looking at the underlying cause of the condition, that um, Hemochromatosis would be diagnosed five to eight years earlier, and that's a significant chunk. And from what Leslie's saying, that the similar similar situation applies. Yes, and um, following on from a comment earlier about uh, webinars and getting more research points, someone's just commented saying that there is a source called Health Talk UK, formerly uh, Dipex, that have many patient experience stories, and that might be another place to raise more awareness. Uh, the final question that we currently have is just asking what would be the best strategy to start um, working the system and trying to get a collaboration around raising awareness. So I think this comes back to the earlier question, if, if you had to do one thing, what would it be? It'd be how, how would you have that starting point into the NHS um, to really start raising awareness? Are there any recommendations that you have that you haven't already mentioned? Uh, I, I can reinforce a point I made um, early on in my presentation, which was about making an organization big. Um, and I think if I was, well, as I have done here, I guess, um, starting with a little known organization and a little known condition, the starting point has to be a really good brand identity and online presence and some, to some extent a social media presence um, and building a membership base um, so that the credibility starts to build. And it's only once the credibility is in place uh, that awareness raising work can start with a vengeance, in my view. I would certainly agree um, with, with David there, um, and also, you know, certainly um, social media is a big thing. It's certainly a big thing for for younger people. I mean, Twitter is probably more geared um, if you you've got a. Um, a Twitter feed for your own organization or charity, then that's probably geared more towards health professionals, so they're more likely to pick it up and then start following others. And if they see that you're tweeting, so to tweet regular, to 
tweet about the research for you and information about the condition and the more you're out there the more you'll be seen and then you'll get more followers and uh, and start to raise awareness whereas something like Facebook is probably more geared towards your service users the patients really um, who tend to be more active um, on there and I would certainly say it's um, you know no matter how small you are if you're out there you're active the more you get out there join umbrella organizations such as genetic alliance or as I mentioned um, when I did the presentation armor um, for us because it was musculoskeletal which is relevant for our particular condition it's finding those groups becoming part of them um, getting out to some of the smaller conferences and, and just be seen and then the more you're out there the more people will will pick up. Brilliant. Thank you both so much for those answers. We don't have any more questions at the moment. I will wait a minute to see if any other comes in. We are coming to the end of our time. Um, so unless there is anything else, then I will thank our lovely speakers for giving their time and giving such excellent presentations. Um, again, thank you to our sponsor Camaradas who are helping making these happen and thank you everyone very much for joining. Um, you can see my contact details on the screen right now so if there are any final questions or anything that's come up that pops into your head afterwards please just drop me an email. As I mentioned at the start, we are recording, and we have been recording, so we will be sharing it online shortly, and you'll get an email probably tomorrow, just an automated email with a link to that. So if there are any points you missed or would like to listen to again, you will be able to. So once again, thank you very much to our speakers. Thank you for listening, and I hope we see you again at a future webinar. Thank you very much.